we now open this up to questions from the uh, from the audience. Chris. Um, I have a question. It seems like um, one of the biggest building blocks we have in New Jersey is getting green infrastructure implemented at scale is money. And um, I'm curious, okay, um, what's motivated the, the huge investment that, that Syracuse has been able to make? If it's really the EPA and the uh, consent decree that um, and recognition that the county has to do something and it's just a matter of, of how. Um, New Jersey cities in general have not yet faced that kind of uh, regulatory stick. Uh, you know, so we did have the regulatory stick. We had to do something and it was a matter of how we needed to go. Did we need to continue to build these regional treatment facilities at a cost that is <coughs> excessive uh, for the community of our size? Uh, or did we want to try to find really a sustainable approach? And when I say sustainable, I don't mean uh, just the green idea of sustainability. I mean the economic, uh, long-term, the longevity, uh, you know, of of the fiscal longevity of being able to afford this infrastructure 20 or 30 years from now. And I think we decided that green infrastructure. We and, and don't get me wrong, we do have a combination of green and gray in Syracuse. But adding the green in a, such a significant way would really improve our fiscal stability in the long term. And have you had to increase rates or bond to, to pay for both the green and the gray? Uh, no. So we have increased rates, uh, but it hasn't been to, uh, we haven't bonded. Uh, and I, but it wasn't because of the green infrastructure. It was because rates had not been um, increased in, in some time uh, to support so uh, a good example of Onondaga County, uh, we are 450,000 strong. In 1960, we were 450,000 strong, but we take up three times the amount of land space today than we did in 1960. Uh, so the rates uh, really historically haven't increased at, at, to, to support the infrastructure that is now beginning to age to a point where it needs substantial <coughs> reinvestment. Um, so the rates are being increased because of that uh, the, 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 the size of our infrastructure, not because of the green infrastructure. The money that we're using for green infrastructure is actually money saved for those uh, regional treatment facilities that we were going to build and never did. How you doing? Um, everything I heard today was awesome. I have a question um, with regard to. I saw. I heard in the last presentation there was an effort on a, a state level uh, for uh, uh, homeowners to get some sort of rebate <clears throat> on green infrastructure improvements. I was wondering, on a federal level, is there a push um, to offer uh, tax incentives or, or rebates for those type of improvements as well? I can't really speak to the federal push right now. I'm not aware of anything. Um, the, the most recent uh, documentation that's out about green infrastructure initiatives and the push from the US EPA is available. Uh, they have a recent document out on their, uh, their strategies for the coming year that was issued in October. Um, I don't, funding is, is an issue, and how that's going to move forward is going to be it's up to debate. But I haven't seen a push directly for property owners and homeowners incentives at the federal level at this point. Uh, I would just to follow up on that, you know, there's nothing that's coming down the pipeline that I'm aware of in the near future. Though I was at a meeting in DC yesterday of the Environmental Finance Advisory Board to the EPA, uh, and they developed a report which will be should be available online to the EPA's website. Um, I forget the name of what it's called, but essentially the, the 30-second summary of that 46-page report is let's make SRF money truly uh, available specific, let's make an allocation of SRF money uh, specifically available for green infrastructure for stormwater. Uh, New York is already doing that with some of its discretionary money um, for green infrastructure. We have the Green Innovation Grant Program, which is really cool. Uh, it would be great to see other states have the same pot of money. Here. Or, 
Um, Chris, I was mainly wondering um, what hurdles you had to overcome with regard to green rooms, the structural standards, and when I can get more information on how you help uh, folks design for green rooms, because we currently don't have a BMP for that. Sure, so our Deputy County Executive for Physical Services, Matt Millay, uh, was insistent that we share everything, full transparency. Uh, so when we have engineers design a project, uh, we ask them to put their DWG files on the website, so you can, which is essentially the raw design file that any engineer can then manipulate. Um, so you can find all the, the design spe specifications, the construction bid documents, and all of those things for all, all of our projects at our website, savetherain.us. If you go to the top, you'll find green projects, and just click on that, and click on a project that looks good to you, and then all those documents are there available for download. It's probably more information than you want, but it'll be. Um, and if you want to contact me for more questions or anything else, let me know. We've probably got about 18 to two dozen green roofs on the website right now, so you can look at different sizes and shapes and, and, and formats. Syracuse gets a lot of snow. Uh, how does that impact those uh, parking lots and those green uh, aspects? And particularly the carrier dome that collects that water, that's a big roof. How do we deal with that snow in the gray time of the year? What snow? <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually, you know, we have a, a really a, a nice little g unknown gem in Syracuse. It's the State University of uh, New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, they are a wonderful asset. I work for Syracuse University, uh, but I'm a, a, an alum of SUNY ESF, uh, and I think ESF is more of an asset to uh, Syracuse, uh, say the rank, than Syracuse University is when it comes to helping us design things for our cold climate. So first of all, there's the New Hampshire uh, Stormwater Research Center um, at the University of New Hampshire. They have 25 years of data, millions of data points on porous pavement technologies, 28 different kind of variables of porous pavement technology, um, demonstrating that this stuff really does work in cold climates, and this is how you should treat it and maintain it. My point of bringing up SUNY ESF is that they have great botanists there who can identify just the right types of trees, shrubs, and, and, and forbs and grasses of perennials that are not only native, but salt resistant. So when, when we can, which is more often than not, we plant native salt resistant plants in areas where we think we're going to beat them to death in the winter. The good note, news is though that the porous pavement, at least in Syracuse, it is gray a lot. Uh, we'll get dumped on with like three feet of snow, wake up in the morning, they plow it, the sun comes out for a hot second, just enough to melt it, it drains through, um, and then we don't get that black ice problem later in the day and the next day, where they need to come out, come out and salt and resalt and resalt. Plow, salt, melt, drain, dump. Um, so we're actually using, the city is using much less salt or, uh, on these porous pavement applications as well, so that it does, in fact, also then benefit um, the poor plants. I have a question with respect to maintenance, um, both with regard to the porous pavement and uh, roof gardens, because those are the two complaints that I have heard is that with regard to the porous pavement, there is additional maintenance. You can't let leaves and whatnot accumulate dirt. Otherwise, otherwise it loses its effectiveness. And then with regard to the roof gardens, of course, there's a weeding issue. But you know, at some point, it becomes, I am told by people who have it difficult to manage. And I've known uh, at least several people who have um, uh, removed their roof gardens. So how do you address those two things? Uh, so first of all, you know, there's maintenance is, you know, we have to maintain anything that we own. Um, so it's a different kind of maintenance. I'm not going to lie, it was a very steep learning curve for some of the DPW guys on, on how to plow, when to plow, please don't plow. Don't push all the snow into that corner because that's a rain garden now. And like, well, we have to move the snow somewhere. You want us to plow it, we have to put it somewhere. 
uh, and then coming up with a, a new strategy for where to put that snow. In some instances, we put it in a truck and drive it away and dump it somewhere else now. Um, because the compaction of that snow damages the rain gardens. Um, we do rent two times a year the county. When I say we, I really mean the county. Uh, we rent uh, two times a year a, uh, a vacuum truck that we go around the, uh, and, and vacuum all of the parking lots. Once in the spring, after all the uh, sediment and stuff that's been pushed by the plow uh, and any and remaining leaves and trash uh, kind of gets stuck onto the, the parking lot, we vacuum that up. And then once again in the fall, uh, yeah. when the leaves fall. Uh, we also then loan that out to the private parking lot so they can do the same, so we can ensure that what they've built, the infrastructure that we've funded, continues to work for all of us. Uh, and then, you know, there's one small analogy. So what if this corner of this parking lot gets clogged and it no longer allows water um, because we do have this consistent dumping of sediment or leaves or whatever, but the rest of it still drains just fine. Um, so maybe we have this one clogged part, but if the rest of it's working, maybe it's not that big of a deal. And then finally, the green roofs. We have a 17,000 square foot green roof on our building that I work in. Uh, we had a tree, an aspen growing on it. An aspen is a, uh, what do they call it, a transitional species. Um, and we went out and, and, and kind of took a trowel, and you have to be very careful so you don't damage the roof, uh, and pull it out. But the weeding, the weeding is certainly a problem, but again, two times a year we go out there and we pull out the, the crown vetch, uh, the other kind of weedy species, and the occasional tree that grows. Um, but the benefit of that is uh, we do actually have a land crew, that will, a landscaping crew that goes out and does that. There are OSHA specifications that do make it difficult with some green infrastructure designs. Um, these guys have to be harnessed so they don't fall off of a roof. So when you build a green roof, you have to also build them a fence. Um, but after a couple of years, once that sedum really gets take, it t takes hold, and usually people grow sedum on green roofs, it's a, it's a very thick ground cover that makes it hard for a lot of other things to take root. And so each year, the, the grounds crew has to visit fewer and fewer uh, times and fewer and fewer hours each time. Um, alternatively, our green roof slants in a way that cantilevers the whole way down to the ground. So sometimes it's nice to come in the morning and find a raccoon sitting outside the window next to my desk. And we do find that. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. Um, problem, opportunity, joy, whatever you want to call it. Um, Maybe yeah. it's the second question I usually get asked when I talk about green construction communities. The first one is how we're going to pay for it. The second one is how we're going to maintain it. Um, the bottom line is we, you know, most communities, when you introduce green infrastructure into it, most communities have the resources available to do the maintenance. It's just a different kind of maintenance. It doesn't, green infrastructure doesn't necessarily require, it doesn't need to require additional uh, uh, equipment or uh, specialized work. It can, most of it and the majority of it is scheduling, planning, and you know, having one or two trained uh, staff available that know how to evaluate what is needed and then get out there and identify the right weeds or identify you know, when we go out and, you know, and clear out the sediments uh, of these systems. And, and more importantly, most communities which are struggling to maintain existing infrastructure, we're not maintaining it the way we should. And we need to reinvest in, in maintaining existing infrastructure and then plan for, again, additional maintenance for new, new strategies. But Jeremiah, one of your proposals, not yours, but one of the state proposals which would incentivize homeowners, mm -hmm. uh, how is the individual homeowner going to conduct this maintenance? Individual homeowners, you know, for the most part, the strategies that individual homeowners are going to be responsible for rain barrels, rain gardens, are strategies that they can very quickly, very easily provide. So what about for these gardens? Those are all strategies that they can learn how to deal with on the ground. For the most part, maintenance on, on green roofs is minimal. It's been, if you're going to have that on your system, I, I've seen very few residential structures where that would be appropriate. For the most part, green roofs are commercial type uh, systems. Uh, for you know, long-term investment uh, and for you know, pervious driveways, pervious paving, they do not require a lot of maintenance. They don't require anything specific other than keeping it clean and making sure that you know, it, it, you know, we don't have leaves building up on it, just raking and blowing the leaves away, and then uh, raking out and moving uh, any set of those floors. It's not extensive, uh, and it can be done by an individual or you know, a standard landscape contractor uh, with specialized training.
not requiring specialized, a lot of specialized equipment for additional costs. Jessica, are construction hey, Jessica. officials general? I have a question. Are construction officials generally very uh, amenable to hand to this, this installation, and are there construct are there standards that are in place that make it easy to put these things in? Are they still resistant? Here in New Jersey or in Syracuse? Well, both. We'll start with Syracuse. Uh, yeah, quickly. Uh, you know, people are resistant to change, and 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 frankly, you know, guys who've been doing something the same way for twenty or thirty years don't want to change because on their desk is this little countdown to retirement calendar. Um, and so uh, change is difficult. Usually when, when they do make that change, then, then they're amenable and they continue with that new direction. Um, and then finally, to the design piece, uh, in New York State, our DEC, similar to the DEP, created a green infrastructure stormwater design manual, which has been kind of held as the uh, standard for green infrastructure BMP design in New York State. There is some alteration to it, and I think the DEC is going to revise it, uh, but they put that out in 2010, and that's really what most people uh, use when they're designing green infrastructure. In New Jersey, no. Construction officials are not amenable to this for the most part. The ones that I have met have been working with. They need, we need, there's a lot of education that has to be done. Uh, and where we are effectively moving forward with green infrastructure, they have been engaged in the conversation, in the plan from the very beginning. They bring to the table what resources they have available, and then we're able to create that, that plan for that community with strategies that they are comfortable with or feel like they can maintain and move forward. Again, not every town is going to want to put in green roofs and or extensive pervious paving solutions. And maybe they don't need to, but they can use other strategies that their facilities Crews are, avail are, are available for maintaining and able to maintain. So it's, it's really going to be, needs to be tailored, green infrastructure needs to be tailored to the individual community and the needs of those communities, and a lot of education has to be done from the local leadership down through the staff, officials, and, um, and to the residents themselves. And in New Jersey, uh, is there guidance that's available that supports green infrastructure and that, that, that these officials can, can follow? Us? Not yet. The New York Stormwater Design Manual is available online. Okay. It seems if we're going to get beyond pilot projects and test cases that we need municipalities that have actual management objectives where they're trying to achieve a specific thing. In the case of Syracuse, that specific thing was getting EPA to be satisfied with their plan, and that's been true of Philadelphia, New York, and other places. Are there places where municipalities have really ramped up on green infrastructure because of local-driven objectives as opposed to regulatory objectives, where they have a very clear sense of what they're looking to achieve and not just to do a pilot project? Um, the two communities in New Jersey that I would that I would say are, are on the forefront of that would be Camden, the city of Camden, um, and also the community of Cranford uh, in Union County. Uh, we've been working in the city of Camden for four years. In the city of Camden, the combined sewer system uh, discharges untreated effluent throughout city streets and parks on a frequent basis. As little as as a as little of it, as much as an inch of rain, they have overflows in some areas of that city. And they have seen this, and the community has seized this um, uh, this issue as a, a threat to the health of the community. And they are embracing green infrastructure uh, citywide. We have 20 to 30 projects already in place, and we're trying to figure out how to move forward with another 20 to 40 or 50 projects that will begin to really meet the pressures on the combined sewer system in the city of Camden. Uh, community of Cranford. Uh, recently adopted an ordinance, a very stringent stormwater ordinance. The reason there is they want to address the flooding issues, uh, the results of Hurricane Irene. They adopted this, uh, this ordinance. You can discuss it with the mayor uh, up there. He's very eloquent on that. He spoke a little bit down at uh, the municipalities in the presentation I attended uh, and we were at. Um, they adopted an ordinance that says that uh, anyone who is adding an addition in the city of, or in the community of Cranford, uh, that would include 400 square feet of new impervious cover, must or more, must manage all the stormwater runoff from, generated from that 400 square feet of impervious cover on site through green infrastructure strategies. You're not allowed to 
create or generate additional stormwater runoff to the storm sewer system. Um, Jeremiah, just to address something you said, you said in New Jersey we currently have no uh, guidance on green. Um, just want to kind of correct you that right. we do have the, the BMP manual yeah, that BMP. does include yeah. uh, green infrastructure initiatives. Actually, Lisa Schaefer, my staff, is currently revising that to make it more user friendly, yeah. and we will be putting that out and hopefully get some feedback. Um, but also, there, right there on the screen, we have the green infrastructure webpage that we are using to promote and uh, you know, push green so that people can see that it does work, just like uh, Chris had with the Syracuse model. If people can see that it does work, we're hoping that they'll believe that they can do it and they'll take the initiative to incorporate green. Got it. Okay. 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 Thank you. I, I'd like to know a little bit about the interaction between the rate increases for the gray infrastructure and the green infrastructure program. Did instituting that program make the rate increases more palatable? Was there, you know, any kind of um, interaction between those two? Boy, um, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. Uh, so, we were going to build these several regional treatment facilities, probably at a, you know, for hundreds of millions of dollars total. Uh, the green infrastructure program is probably a third of that. So you could say we realized a total of two thirds savings by doing green instead of building those treatment facilities. Um, but the rate increase is really because of deferred payment to, uh, for the existing infrastructure. The issue really comes down to the fact that all of the green infrastructure with save um, you know two dozen um, token projects in the sub in the suburbs, um, all of the green infrastructure is happening within the city of Syracuse. Though the whole um, sanitary sewer district, which is all of our essentially the whole uh, suburban and urban part of our county, pay the same sewer rate. Um, so. Uh, there's this kind of tension between the city and the suburban caucus in the legislature, and there's also this perception um, that the rate increase uh, is in part due to the Save the Rain program. Uh, so it's part, um, part this tension between what are we reinvesting in and who's paying for it um, versus what have we invested in and not paid for in the past and are only now coming to begin to pay for. So it's I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's kind of where we're at. But doesn't the green infrastructure uh, help everybody ultimately? I mean, can that, can that yes, I mean, all county taxpayers, all, excuse me, all county ratepayers are paying for okay. Save the Rain and realize the benefit of the savings of the program to this point. Thank you so much. Uh, Stan, looks like you have something to say. I have a question. Just, oh, just, just, just follow through, Pat. Sure. Uh, my question goes to both to uh, Chris, Jeremiah, and Mark. Uh, and the EPA's uh, green infrastructure guidance, it speaks to capture flow upwards, or maybe other capture flows upwards of 10%. I'm curious in your collective uh, respective experiences, what have you experienced? And could you talk a little bit about the cost of that type of project in terms of cost effectiveness versus gray infrastructure? Uh, in Syracuse, we capture 95% of our stormwater. Uh, either through gray or green methods. Um, and, and so that's essentially, and it depends on geography, and so for that, us, that's about first inch of every rainstorm, um, which, I, I, excuse me, which is, that first inch is 95% of all rain events in Syracuse. Um, and we're pretty happy capturing that amount because that's, that's a pretty robust amount of stormwater to capture. Uh, and then um, once you start looking at one and a half, capturing the first inch and a half or two inches, um, uh, there's an economics term for it, I can't remember, but it starts to get prohibitively more expensive to uh, get those incremental increases. So everything we design is at one inch at least, if not more. Yeah. Cost effectively, we're looking at the first inch and a quarter of rain. That water quality is strongly defined for New Jersey through the BMP manual um, that you mentioned. Um, that is, you know, uh, the, again, the 90th, 90th percentile storm here in the state of New Jersey. We're capturing that much rain. We can do that cost effectively. Where possible, we're also looking at you know, designing these systems 
you know, that's an inch and a quarter over two hours. We're also looking at, you know, with rain gardens and bioretention systems and where we can capture a little bit more, looking at being able to capture up to the two-year storm, which is uh, about three inches of rain over the course of uh, 24 hours. By designing just a little bit larger and accounting for the infiltration in some of these BMPs, we can actually make these uh, systems a little more resilient as we as we will most likely get more uh, uh, intense and more frequent storm events over the course of the year. But both of these, we've been able to, to design cost-effectively uh, in, uh, in New Jersey. Thank you. Um, we will now take a break, and when we return, we'll uh, open the floor to public testimony. Let me remind you, if you have not signed up to deliver testimony and you would like to do so, um, please leave your name at the desk out front. Thank you.